speaking classes, they always suggested having a hook, like a, something either humorous or like a story, something that grabs people's attention and kind of engages them. I wish I had one this morning, but and instead, we're just gonna, I just got a fact for you. So this morning's topic is from dust to glory, from dust to glory. And before we talk about that, you know, English is the only language that capitalizes the personal pronoun that refers to the self. In other words, I. You know, you always capitalize I. We're the only language who does that. And I, I was kind of thinking why that is, and there's different theories, but I think it's a fact that speaks to a certain egocentric view that we tend to have as humans, not just in Western culture, but all around. We kind of think everything is for us, and uh, everything's just, we're supposed to capitalize on it. Like, I don't know how to explain it all, but you understand there's like this selfish self-centeredness to the world, I think, that we can all identify in ourselves at different points. And I think our self-centeredness is painfully prevalent when it comes to the creation. Here's what I mean. If you look at Job 38, this is one of my favorite passages. God is speaking to Job. Remember, Job is, uh, lays some accusations against God, and then he's like, I would prove my case. And then God says, all right, <laughs> stand up, be a man. <laughs> let's have this conversation. Let's engage in this. And God says, who has cleft a channel for the torrents of rain and a way for the thunderbolt to bring rain on a land where no man is? Where no man is, on the desert in which there is no man, to satisfy the waste and desolate land and to make the ground sprout with grass. I think that is utterly fascinating that God's saying, look, I take care of creation. I take care of parts of the world that humans will never see. And I make sure they get their food. I make sure that it gets its rain. Why? Because God loves life. God cares about <coughs> creation. In Psalm 147, 8 through 9, the psalmist writes, he covers the heavens with clouds, he prepares rain for the earth, he makes grass grow on the hills, he gives to the beasts their food and to the young ravens that cry. That God sees all of these things. He sees his creatures. He knows what they need. He makes grass sprout upon hills. Why? Because God is a God of creation and life. In Jonah 4.11, the famous passage, when God says, I'm going to show mercy to these Ninevites, they don't know their right hand from their left. And he says, and why would I destroy it? And there's also much cattle. God even totaled up the, the lives of the cattle that would be lost if he destroyed the city. So God is not apathetic. God's, God's interest is not solely in humanity and creation. It is his creation and humanity. All these passages speak to the truth that God cares about more than just humans, because after all, God created humans to steward the earth. Human sin on the earth and well, human sin and the earth are rarely connected to one another in thought. I think that we separate it. We think it's just like some spiritual out there thing, like our sin is just in this invisible realm. But that's not the scriptural worldview. And so we're going to walk through that this morning. Today we're going to talk about humanity's connection to the earth, God's movement of reversal to reverse the curse, and finally from roots to restoration. So let's focus on the first one, humanity's connection to the earth. In Genesis 2-7, it says, Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. Now, they're supposed to take care of the garden. They're supposed to expand the garden. But what they do? They sinned. They disobeyed the law that God had provided for them. That was a life-giving command, right? It was, to, it was so that they would live the command that he gave them. And what's the result of the dis disobedience? Look at Genesis 3.17. It says, And to Adam he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. It continues in verse 19. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken. For you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Now, something very interesting, you know, Adam in Hebrew, you know what it comes from? Adama, which means dirt, ground. So Adam is made from Adama. So there's this connection between mankind and the earth, where it's from dust to dust. We go, this cycle. So there's two curses. Notice that death on humans, right? We brought from dust to dust. And then we also have a curse on the ground, that the earth is also cursed. So our origins are inextricably tied to the earth. We were created out of it and we will return to it. That's just a fact of life. Man's sin directly affected the creation. 
The ground, or Adamah, was cursed because of you, God says, because of the sin that mankind uh, introduced. So in Leviticus 18.24, I wanted to, to call our minds the, the real world effect that our sin has on creation. In Leviticus 18 and verse 24, God is speaking to the Israelites. He says, do not, do not make yourselves unclean by any of these things. And in context, he's talking about sins of sexual immorality. He says, for by all these nations, I, I am driving out before you, you have become unclean. And the land became unclean so that I punished its iniquity and the land vomited out its inhabitants. Look at Leviticus 18, verse 26. He says, but you shall keep my statutes and my rules and do none of these abominations either the native or the stranger who sojourns among you, lest the land vomit you out when you make it unclean, as it vomited out the nation that was before you. So God speaks of the earth as having some form of awareness of the sin that mankind brings to it. It affects the earth in some way, shape, or form. What that means exactly, I don't know. But that's how God speaks of these things. Look at the prophets in Isaiah 24 and verse 4. Isaiah says, The earth mourns and withers, the world languages languishes and withers the highest people of the earth languish the earth lies defiled under its inhabitants for they have transgressed the laws violated the statutes broken the everlasting covenant therefore a curse devours the earth and its inhabitants suffer for their guilt therefore the inhabitants of the earth are scorched and few men are left you notice kind of the creation language that's going on there that genesis language of the ground, the earth being cursed, and mankind dying. See, it's this callback to this state in creation that we brought about, this bad state, right? God created a good world, and we messed it up. We messed it up, guys. We blew it. In Jeremiah 12 and verse 4, the prophet says, How long will the land mourn the grass and the grass of every field wither? For the evil of those who dwell in it, the beast and the birds are swept away, because they said, He will not see our latter end. What's the effect of the sin of the Israelites going on here? What's the effect? The creation dies. Creatures die. In Hosea 4, uh, 1, it says, Hear the word of the Lord, O children of Israel. For the Lord has a, controversy, has a controversy with the inhabitants of the land. There is no faithfulness or steadfast love and no knowledge of God in the land. Therefore, the land mourns, and all who dwell in it languish, and also the beasts of the field and the birds of the heavens, and even the fish of the sea are taken away. You see, this is a repeated theme all throughout Scripture, from Genesis to the prophets of this idea of human sin affecting creation. As Scripture clearly reveals, humanity is tied to creation, for better or for worse. Well, mainly for worse in the case of creation, because our sin affects it. We were formed out of it, we will return to it, and it hurts because of human sin. But just as sin defiled both humanity and the earth, God set in motion a plan that was not just for our redemption, but for creation's redemption. And that gets to our second point, which is God's movement of reversal. What's God going to do about this tainting of the land that mankind pollutes his good creation with because of our sin? God did not want humanity and the good earth he created to remain filthy. He made movements of reversal to remove that curse or reverse that curse. And we see this in Genesis 6 and verse 11. Remember that the earth was corrupt in God's sight? It says he repented he regretted of making mankind because of the violence for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. And in verse 17, God speaking to Noah, he says, For behold, I will bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh in which is the breath of life under heaven. Everything that is on the earth shall die. Do you remember what God did in Genesis 1 when he was creating? Remember there's the chaotic waters and God separated the waters from the waters, right? Created an inhabitable inhabitable place, land, earth, otherwise. And then what happens in the flood? It's a decreation. God brings the waters from above and below back down. So he's reversing his creation. He's reverting the earth back to the chaotic state it was in before he brought order by separating the chaos waters. And in chapter 8 and verse 4, it says, and in the seventh month, on the 17th day of the month, the ark came to rest. Keep that in mind, rest, the idea of rest there, on the mountains of Ararat. And I want you to also keep in mind that it's the seventh month. All right, is seven an important number in Scripture? Yeah, or it's hearkening back to the days of creation, right? The seven days of creation. In Genesis 9, 16, when they come out on dry land, God makes a covenant with, with Noah and his family and also the earth and the creatures in it. It says, when the bow is in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant 
between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. And if you back up, you can see it even more explicitly, a, a covenant, an everlasting covenant with Noah and his family and with the creation. So God, think about what he's doing here. He destroyed the corrupted earth while simultaneously, simultaneously renewing it. If you look at what 2 Peter says in 2 Peter 3, it talks about the earth that then existed, that then existed was deluged with water and perished. Where, where, where are we standing? <laughs> right? We're standing on the earth, but it was a new creation that God made out of it. So God set in place different celebrations to continue in this renewal. In Leviticus 16 and verse 29, it says, And it shall be a statute forever that in the seventh month, all right, where are we connecting there? It says, On the tenth day of the month that you shall afflict yourselves and shall do no work, either the native or the stranger who sojourns among you. For on this day shall atonement be made for you to cleanse you. You shall be clean before the Lord from all your sins. It is a Sabbath of solemn rest. Rest, remember the ark rested in the seventh month. To you and you shall afflict yourselves, it is a statute forever. If you go back, this is about the Day of Atonement, which was also coincided with Sabbath day. And if you look at what happens in verse 7 and 8, it says, Then you shall take the two goats and set them before the Lord at the entrance of the tent of meeting. And Aaron shall cast lots over the two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other lot for Azazel. So think about what's happening. The Day of Atonement was a great reset. Right, Because there was the camp of Israel, and in it was God's presence in the temple or in the tabernacle. And around them, in context, is the wilderness. Right, So you've got chaos and you have order. And so it's this re renewing, it's this cleansing of sacred space, of sacred geography, and getting that sin and putting it where it, be where it belongs, in the chaos. And it took place in the seventh month again. So this is just like the flood that cleansed the land by separating chaos from order in the seventh month. And it's a callback to when God rested on the seventh day, when he completed his work. So see, this, this rest is connected to the seventh month, to creation. In Leviticus 25 and verse 3, it says, For six years you shall sow your field, and for six years you shall prune your vineyard and gather in its fruits. But in the seventh year there shall be a Sabbath of solemn rest for the land, a Sabbath to the Lord. You shall not sow your field or prune your vineyard. In verse 9 of chapter 25, it says, Then you shall sound the loud trumpet on the tenth day of the seventh month. On the day of atonement, you shall sound the trumpet throughout all your land, and you shall consecrate the fiftieth year and proclaim liberty throughout the land and all its inhabitants. It shall be a jubilee for you when each of you shall return to his property and each of you shall return to his clan. So God wanted a Sabbath on the seventh day of the week, a Sabbath year in the seventh month, and a year of jubilee in the seventh month every 50 years. Why is rest and jubilee and Sabbath so important to God? And why is it so important that's in the seventh month? See, again, the, all these things are tied. The, the, those little details like the seventh month, that's not an accident, right? There's weight being convey, conveyed. There's ideas being conveyed just by the very date of the event. So this rest was made for both mankind and all the land. This is a movement of restoration from the curse that mankind brought to the earth through sin, introducing death. Did Israel honor their covenant? No. And look at 2 Chronicles 36.20. Very interesting language. It says, He took into exile in Babylon those who had escaped from the sword, and they became servants to him and to his sons until the establishment of the kingdom of Persia to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah until the what? Until the land had enjoyed its Sabbaths, and all the days that it lay desolate, it kept Sabbath to fulfill 70 years. So think about what's happening here. God exiled his own covenant people from the land he promised them. Why? Well, obviously because their sin, their idolatry, but also because God cared about his creation. And he wanted the land to enjoy its rest. See, that's why I'm talking about this egocentric view we tend to have about the world. God cares about his creation as well, which gets us to the third point, from roots to restoration. So just as a recap, mankind was created out of the earth and to it we will return. Mankind's rebellion led to a curse on the earth, and God set in place different movements to abate the harm that sin created for the land. So all the Sabbaths and celebrations needed to be repeated. Why? Because we sin a lot. <laughs> it had to be reset. It had to continually, continually keep resetting because we kept bringing in chaos. We kept bringing in sin and death into God's holy places, into sacred space. The question remained, will God put a final end to the curse of death 
and the curse that was put upon creation. So there's a twofold thing here. So this was God's answer to the curse of death. In Romans 5.12, Paul writes, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. And I love, he, can, he expounds on that idea more in 1 Corinthians 15. He writes, For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. The first man was from the earth, a man of dust. A man of dust. The second man is from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are of the dust. We're just like Adam. We're, we're, we will return to the dust. We will return to the earth. And as is the man of heaven, so also are those who are of heaven. Just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. God's answer to the curse of from dust to dust is to resurrect that dust into a glorified body just like the one that Jesus wears. That's the glory of the resurrection, which is good. That's awesome news, right? Like we know we die and that stinks. <laughs> Thanks, Adam and Eve, you know, but we would have done the same thing. We bear his image. We're, like, we're just like him. We disobey. We, we make assumptions. We go out on and follow our will instead of God's will. But the good news is Jesus allows us to put on his image, to wear him, and that makes us children of God. But what about the curse on the land? What about the thorns and the thistles? How will that curse be reversed? And notice Paul's language here, thinking about all these concepts. In Romans 8, 19, it says, For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. Who's that? It's you and I. For the creation was subjected to futility. Who did that? (laughs) We did that, right? We were the ones who subjected it to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. I just, I'm thinking about that language when God says that this, the, the land, the earth is suffering because of the sin and we'll spit you out of the land because you're damaging it, Right? And this is a renewal. This is a reversal. And verse 23, and not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. In other words, the resurrected glorified body that he talks about in 1 Corinthians 15. He says, for in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope for who hopes for what he sees. So humans were created out of the earth to steward it, And instead, we brought it under a curse. Jesus, the man of heaven, came to make us new creations in his image to be children of God. And God will one day use use we who wear Christ's image to restore the very creation that we defiled. See, it's God took the story of our failures and flipped it on its head. Where we were the problem, and now he's making us the solution. I just think that's absolutely beautiful. And you see the genius of God's plan in this. In Colossians 1.19, very powerful language. I love this passage. It says, For in him, Jesus, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Jesus' death, Jesus' sacrifice, is the unifying force that brings all of these things together. That makes up for all the wrongs we've committed, the damage that we've done to God's creation, the damage that we've done to ourselves, the damage that we do to each other is flipped on its head if we put on the image of Christ. So this leads us to our applications. One, remind yourself daily of what our hope is. There's a lot to get discouraged about. There's a lot of of trials, things we go through. And I just wonder if we had this on our minds more and more, if we reminded ourselves of this every day, would that make our, our, our sadness a little brighter? Would that affect the way we treated other people? Would maybe we be kinder? Would we be a little bit more patient? In Revelation 21.1, I love this. It says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And he continues in 22.3, No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will serve him. That's a reality promised to us if we are in the Lamb's book of life. 
if we have been baptized into his blood, into the water, and raised up a new creature. Second, become agents of restoration in the image of Christ. And Micah 6, 8, what does this look like? This is like where the rubber meets the road. This is how we behave. This is how all these things actually affect us. This is what we need to do. It says, he has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. Is that rocket science? I don't think so. I think it's pretty straightforward what God wants from his creatures. And I just love the idea of to love mercy. We don't love mercy. We really don't. I think maybe we think we do, but when you see like criminals who did something awful on TV, you know, we watch the news, we want justice, right? And we understand that's an instinct within us. When people wrong us, do we love it when, when people who wrong us, who are mean to us, who are rude to us, when they get rewarded or they get that raise or they get that promotion, are you happy? Like, yes, that's good. That's what Jesus calls us to do to be agents of restoration, to love mercy. In 2 Corinthians 5, 18 through 20, Paul writes, all this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. We were reconciled, and that doesn't mean we just sit there and go, oh, all right, I'm reconciled. We become agents of reconciliation. He says uh, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation we are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. And I love that. Now, what does that mean for us? That means we don't hold people's trespasses that they commit against us, against them. <clears throat> that we have the attitude of, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. We embody Christ's forgiveness, Christ's forgiveness and his mercy. In Romans 12, 17 through 21, Paul writes, Do not repay anyone, for e do not repay anyone evil for evil, be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. That, that is what Christ is. That is who Christ is. You think about all the evil and justice as Brother Charlie talked about, the suffering, the pain, the mockery of a trial. And how did he, did he fight back? No. He bore it because his love outweighed the sin. His love outweighed the selfishness that humans exhibit. And so when you're overwhelmed, when you're tempted, when you feel like the world's against you, people are against you, you know what the solution is? It's not to fight against it. It's not to take revenge. It's to out-love it. Out-love them. To out-love them. And that's a difficult thing. That's one of the most difficult things, to love your enemies, right? As Jesus taught. And finally, 1 Peter 4, 8, 8 through 10, it says, Above all, love each other deeply, because love covers a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. I remember when I was a kid, um, we, were, we were holding hands and saying a prayer, my brothers and my dad. And he was leading us in prayer. We, we were holding hands. And my older brother, Nathan, we were little. We were really little. Nathan had been watching some like, show or playing some game where there's a boss with like a, it was a giant hand. And it like squeezed him, and for, he was, you know, of course, zoning out and thinking about that. So he started, uh, you know, not purposely, he started squeezing my hand during the prayer. And he, just, he had a strong grip. <laughs> and, he's just, and so I kind of start squirming, and I don't want to interrupt because my dad's praying, so I'm just trying to squirm. Then when the prayer was done, my dad was like, what's wrong with you? Why are you fidgeting around so much? I said, ah, Nathan's squeezing my hand. <laughs> and it hurt, and I didn't know what to do. Oh, that made my dad so mad. And he was about to get a whooping. I saw the anger in my dad's eyes. I saw the fear in my brother's eyes. And I said, Dad, it was an accident. I was like, he wasn't trying to. It, it, and like, I, I saw just something click in his mind. And he just, he dropped and he said, all right, it's okay. And like, we all went on. And he said, you know, that petition softened his heart from anger to this love and this attention. And I just think, that's what Jesus does for us to the Father. He vouches for us. He says, Father, forgive him. He doesn't know what he's doing. He's a bonehead. I figure out how I'm working on him. But I died for him. 
He's our advocate. And finally, take up the yoke that leads to true rest, the idea of rest that all of this is about. In Matthew eleven twenty nine, 29, Jesus says, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. You'll find Sabbath for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So my question is, have you entered into God's rest that was paid for by the blood of his own son by dying to yourself in baptism? That extension, I, I'm reminded of Hebrews 4, where the Hebrew writer says, do not fail to enter the rest that God has provided. He warned them, and those who did not believe, they perished in the wilderness. It's, God wants to redeem you, but there's a time limit, because you're mortal, because you will return to dust one day. And then what's your hope? When you return to dust, will you be part of the resurrection and this glorification and this glorious role that God has caused us to be, this agent of reconciliation, this agent of renewal and new creation? Or will we be lost because we failed to believe, because we failed to obey our gracious God who died for us? If you would like to become a Christian, we ask that you come forward as we stand and sing number 159.